All right. Good evening. Welcome to the program. You're listening to The Soapbox here on 90.9, 104.1 WMPG, Southern Maine's community radio from the University of Southern Maine. My name is Eric Poulin. Thank you very much for joining me this evening. Um, and thank you very much for calling in uh, last week. And we had another successful begathon here at WMPG. So we very much appreciate that community radio one of the last bastions in uh, media to talk about some important issues. And um, uh, this is one of them. Thank you, Ed. Um, okay, so uh, tonight my guest on the show is Susan Finer, who is a uh, professor of economics and women and gender studies at U University of Southern Maine. And she's here this evening to uh, discuss sort of the most recent round of austerity that is happening here at USM. So thank you for joining me here, uh, Susan. You're very welcome, Eric. It's uh, good to be here, and I hope uh, lots of people will be more and more interested in this issue and participate in the solidarity rallies. I heard uh, just a few minutes ago we're being talked about by the last group of guests, <laughs> so this is a fortuitous segue. Yes, definitely. Um, and of course, uh, this is the community uh, community's airwaves, and we want to welcome people to call in and join the discussion. So if you'd like to do that, call 780-4909, and uh, Ed will patch you through to us. So uh, let's start at the beginning, Susan, for people who might just be tuning in. Um, what what is the uh, what do the most recent cuts look like? I know that uh, there's been a round of layoffs. With more to come. They're not layoffs. They're, not. they're retrenchments. The somewhere between thirteen and fifteen people have actually received letters terminating their relationship to the university. That's a fluid number because well, we're not being given more concrete information than that. There are some departments where faculty retirements have been sort of horse traded to preserve for at least one more year the positions of more junior faculty. But uh, I am not privy to any information that confirms how many of those trades have actually been uh, cemented. So somewhere between 15, 13 and 15 people have actually been terminated from the university as of May 31st. There were originally scheduled to be 18 to 20 of those terminations, but there were enough last minute retires by senior faculty that a number of people who got phone calls from the provost's office setting up a meeting for the phone calls came on Thursday, March 20th, if that's the right date, and then on Friday the 21st was when that first big demonstration was in the outside the president uh, outside the president and provost offices as the faculty who had gotten those phone calls were coming up to the provost office for their meetings where they were in fact terminated. So we know that again 18 to 20 people got these phone calls and were asked to come see the provost, actually only somewhere between 13 and 15 got handed the letters of termination or got emails of termination. Some people were terminated by email who had tenure here. Oh, my gosh. And um, then there's some of these deal, some deal making going on in the background. So that's, um, that's what we know on the personnel side, that these people with most of them with tenure or tenure track have been fired. Their positions in their departments have been eliminated. But one of the big things that the faculty uh, have been discussing in recent days is the fact, students, this is a fact, the university is saying they don't need these people's services anymore. That's why they're being fired. Yet the vast majority of the courses that these professors have offered remain on the calendar, remain in Main Street as courses that students can sign up for. What's different is that where it used to say 
for example, Professor Bouvier or Professor Mamgame or Professor um, Brody. It now says staff. So the university thinks that somehow or other, let's see, let's say it's 12 faculty. They each teach three courses a semester. So 12 times three when I went to school was 36. So somehow there are enough PhD qualified persons in the greater Portland area who are prepared to teach these classes and that they think they can hire them for the pitiful uh, instructor salary that we offer. So there's a whole lot of assumptions going on. And this is what's even crazier. If you end up canceling those sections, you lose money. Because every one of those fired professors was teaching full classrooms. So it does not make any sense to me why you would lay off faculty who teach classes that generate way more than the revenue, who teach classes that generate revenue in excess of their salaries. Okay, so that that is a really vexing sort of question, and I'd like to hear from you what the um, the university's argument is for that. And also, just to throw it out there, you know, uh, in terms of numbers, USM claims to be facing a $14 million no, budget. No, USM sh- doesn't claim that. The uni- Well, University of Southern Maine administrators have repeated the language of the University of Maine system. Okay. So that deficit did not materialize on our books. That deficit uh-huh. materialized because of the University of Maine system's bookkeeping. Okay, and they, the system, is facing a $36 million they shortfall. They claim they f- are facing a $36 <laughs> million dollar shortfall. And they also claim that USM's sort of share of that is $14 million. So from their perspective, they're saying this: these are dire financial times. Uh, what else could we do but look to save some money and and how how else can we save some money besides laying off some 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 uh you know well i added up the salaries of the faculty who were laid off at usm and their combined salaries with benefits are just around eight hundred thousand dollars a year now i think there's a really big gap between eight hundred thousand dollars a year (laughs) and the 14 million dollar deficit we supposedly face. At the same time, if you add up the salaries of people who are administrators at USM, their salaries and benefits add up to $9.8 million. So if you face a $14 million deficit, please explain to me how firing 14 or so faculty with tenure, which has a uh, almost 100-year history in the United States of tenure as a job protection that university and college professors have because we need job security in order to pursue the research and the questions and the interactions with our students that uh, if we don't have tenure, then it stifles your ability to ask questions and to uh, challenge students to think through what some of the things are they believe. Uh, and so anyway, that's a, that was a little digression. <laughs> Nevertheless, how is it that firing $800,000 worth of tenured faculty makes a really big dent in our fourteen alleged $14 million deficit, but not laying off a single person in the $9.8 million administrative budget doesn't make a dent in our $14 million deficit. So it's all very mysterious. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, so let's just sort of cut to it. What, in your mind, is actually going on? It seems to me... Like uh, there is a, they're they're working on um, transforming the university system, um, 
And may, are they using these supposed budget shortfalls as an excuse to realize their vision of a, of a transformed system? Um, or I guess, you know, if, if it sounds like you're saying that these, these are supposed budget shortfalls, they may not necessarily actually be there. Um, so what is the intent behind this? Just to rile up students and, and get rid of some faculty that they don't like? Uh, certainly the latter. <laughs> I think uh, when you look at who the faculty are that have been fired and uh, the predominance of women and women of color in that group, mm. and it's very clear that people were targeted. Uh, the university is going to say, well, the union contract requires us to go from least senior up, but there's nothing in the union contract that says which departments are targeted. And if you are supposed to go from least senior to most senior, then someone who was hired in September 2013 is less senior than someone who has tenure and has been here 10 years. And there are many people, well, I, there are certainly members of the faculty at USM, and I am not saying they should be fired. I am not saying that. Again, I am not saying that. But if the if the rationale is least senior to most senior, then that was not followed, at least not in a, te in a way that uh, encompasses all the faculty. There were departments targeted, virtually all the departments targeted, all but one of the departments targeted, are in the liberal arts, mm -hmm. are in the traditions of economics and social sciences and arts and the humanities. Mm -hmm. Now, in the trustees, the, this is a direction that's being pushed by the Board of Trustees and the Chancellor's Office, and our president and our provost do not have the cojones to stand up for it, for USM, and they've just been bowled over by this, or maybe they agree with it. There are three motivations that I can fathom behind this uh, really unprecedented attack on faculty. First is it is anti-union. USM faculty are collectively bargained, and this behavior um, totally contravenes the way faculty and the administration uh, are, are supposed to interact with each other under the terms of our contracts. Second of all, it is an attack on tenure. There are a number of very high-paid consultants in the United States now who go around and consult with college boards, uh, trustees of colleges, and the trustees of public universities and university systems on how tenure is the problem at, pub at universities. And those darn pesky faculty, they've got jobs for life, and look at how much they get paid, and we could actually, if we could get rid of tenure, and instead of paying somebody $60,000 a year for teaching six courses a year, which is ten grand a year, if we could replace them with part-time adjuncts who get paid maximally $5,000 a course, we suddenly have $30,000 more, which we can do what with? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe we'll pay our pro sh shareholders. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, the University of Maine system doesn't have any shareholders. Oh, sorry, but we need to drive our profits up. So that's the second one is break tenure, break union, break tenure. And the third one, which is of a piece, is to decrease access of working people to a high-quality, robust college education. So they go together. Hmm. Okay. Um, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Soapbox here on WMPG. My guest this evening is Susan Finer. She's a professor at USM of Economics and Women and Gender Studies. If you'd like to join the conversation, please do so. Call us up at 780-4909. So, Susan, am I crazy also in, in saying... Probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you if you sort of purge the system of tenured professors who, as you say, have job security and are free to really um, do uh, intensive research and explore ideas without 
uh, concern to job security, um, and you replace them with cheap, cheaper, adjunct, less secure staff. Contingent. Yeah, contingent. Then isn't it also true that one of the benefits that comes with that from the university's perspective is they can lean on those people a little bit more? I mean, they can. Well, not only can they lean on them more, but those pesky ideas are going to go away because there's no expectation on the part of part-time adjunct contingent faculty that they carry and produce research the way full-time faculty are, which is, which is not to say that many of the wonderful people teaching our colleges and universities across the United States today haven't been remarkably successful researchers. What's happened is, and this is documented brilliantly, folks, in a book by Benjamin Ginsberg from Johns Hopkins called The Fall of the Faculty. And you can Google that, The Fall of the Faculty, and you'll get some nice book reviews, and uh, you can read it on Google Books. He's got some very nice charts how uh, 20 years ago, at the most... 20% of college and university courses were taught by part-time adjuncts. Today in the United States, over 50% of college courses are taught by part-time adjuncts, and the number is even higher than that if you include the for-profit and the community college sectors. So, um, so many people with PhDs can't get full-time jobs. By the way, who do you think is more represented among the part-time adjunct uh, contingent workforce, why that would be women and scholars of color. So again, there's this whole uh, gender discrimination dimension going on. But many of these people, they're highly trained. They have PhDs. My goodness, you don't get your PhD by sending in a bunch of cereal box tops. At least you didn't when I went to school. So many of these people, their only possibility of getting a permanent job is to uh, publish and write books, and somehow or other they managed to. Uh, I believe in The Atlantic, last month or the month before, there was a story about a woman with a PhD who had been a professor and she got, she didn't get tenure, and uh, she wound up evicted from her apartment and she had to couch surf while teaching at four different universities in the metropolitan New York area. Anyway, it's a really horrible story. A horrible story. Um, so if you switch to a part-time contingent workforce, yes, they will be much more submissive. And they'll also be teaching from a preset curriculum. Because if you're a part-time adjunct faculty member, you don't get to just waltz into the university and say, oh, I want to teach uh, my brand of philosophy or my approach to economics. You get handed a syllabus. You get handed a syllabus, and you're told what books to assign. You're told what books to assign. Mm. You're told what to grade on. And uh, Professor Ginsburg, in the fall of the faculty, has a really chilling, uh, brave new college kind of uh, vision of departments and universities. There'll be one or two, maybe three sort of rock star professors with big names, and they'll design curriculum or they'll figure out what the courses should be. And then there'll be people who are um, techies who will figure out how to put that content online and how to assess it. And then there'll be hordes of part-time adjuncts who sit behind computers someplace and students watch the lectures on the computer and send in their work to these adjuncts and they send their questions to these adjuncts. And it's all totally monitored, and uh, every keystroke that goes between the, the instructor and the student is captured and analyzed. And if you don't have enough keystrokes between you and the students, then you're fired. I, it just is very dystopian and very, very scary. So, Susan, if we could maybe broaden this just a little bit, why should – explain to people who are listening – who are just citizens in southern Maine uh, or maybe listening online, who don't, they're not going to USM, they're not going to college, they don't have students who are planning on going to college. Why is, why is what's happening on campus at USM and in the University of Maine system, why is this significant to them? Why should they care about this? 
because the economy of the state of Maine will not be able to grow into the 21st century. And this is this is very functional. This isn't so there are huge economic consequences. Time magazine just said that Portland is one of a dozen or so cities in America that gets it. Portland has in the Portland region, 46 percent of the adults over the age of 25 have college or master's degrees. And that's why 50 percent of the economic activity in the state of Maine occurs in Cumberland, York and Sagadaha counties, because there is a mass here of creative intelligence, of trained people who can uh, have the ideas and the skills to create economic activity that generates enough more economic activity for the rest of us to have jobs. So there is the whole job side of it. But there's also, do we want to just be appendages to machines? The whole issue of the people of the state of Maine having access to the quality of education that the richest people... Harvard isn't talking about ending its liberal arts program. Bowdoin isn't talking about ending its liberal arts program. Colby boasts about how low its student-teacher enrollment is. Why don't the students, why don't the people of the state of Maine and their children and even themselves, if they're interested, why don't they deserve a classroom experience that is... 15 students with a Ph.D. qualified professor to explore the ideas that are most meaningful to them in their lives, whether it is global warming or um, the history of the Bible or Greek mythology or quantitative methods in social science research or engineering or 17th century literature Those are deeply important, deeply, deeply important to us personally. And if we don't understand the, if we don't begin to have insight into these dimensions of human life that hold the highest regard in our society, I mean, then what? How do we possibly think we're going to navigate our way to a future that is even a quarter decent for any of us? Um, yeah, think about just think about people who are members of Congress. Think about people who um, achieve great things. They are people who are. Well, maybe not members of Congress, yeah, I really. Say. I should back away from that really quickly. Um, there are lots of big ideas out there, and we need to think about them, and we need to have people who are trained to think about them so that they can solve problems, whether they're business problems, whether they are problems of climate, whether they are problems of homelessness, mm. whether they are problems of how to keep our roads from falling apart. But people need a broad-based education to think through complicated problems. If we were still facing a technology of shovels to dig ditches to drain the fields so that we could grow carrots and turnips and hope that we have enough dry to get through the winter, then maybe we wouldn't need access to public higher education for everybody. But we don't live in that world. We live in a world where people turn on their cell phones the first thing they do when they get up. Well, wouldn't it be nice if there were people in Maine who understood how to build the programs that the cell phones run on? Um, Have I convinced you? (laughs) Yeah, so well, (laughs) you're preaching to the choir here. I mean, I, I think that what's happening at USM right now to me is indicative of this broader cultural shift happening in the uh, academic world right now. And it's this increasingly restrictive, corporatized environment. And everything, whether it's academia or the government, 
seems to be or media as you started out the show right um seems like the the uh ethos is we need to run this like a business there are some things i would like to remind all the listeners of what a great job all those businesses did in 2008 <laughs> and all the great job all these businesses are doing and we still have over 12 million americans without jobs and the great job that um, businesses around the world are doing curbing pollution so what does running it like a business actually mean? It, when you push on that metaphor, it doesn't hold up. It means some people make a lot of money and a lot well, of people suffer. Why should we restrict ourselves then to running it like a business? Why don't we just run it like a slave plantation mm. and take, take away people's human rights? Well, I mean, they, you can make a lot more money if the people who are working in your factory are slaves. Why pay them anything? I would I would say we're not that far. We're, that's from that. that we're not down that far down the trajectory yet. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time, and I would like to ask you before we leave, um, what can people do about this? Where can they go to have their voices heard if they're if they object to what's happening at USM? There's solidarity. What is it? Hashtag solidarity USM. Oh my goodness! I wish I could remember. There's. <laughs> Uh, there's going to be a rally in Monument Square on Tuesday at noon, a rally and teach-in. I would urge everyone who's concerned about this to attend, um, members of the community as well as students and faculty. There are a number of uh, websites, uh, Facebook pages, excuse me. If you, go, if you go to Facebook and type in Solidarity US May, USM, and also hashtag USM Future. You'll find the two uh, Facebook pages where all these activities and opportunities for uh, volunteering and being part of this incredibly important movement. People should realize that as small as Maine is and as small as USM is, we've gotten response from all over the world. Good. Um, yeah, so and I strongly encourage everyone to go, citizens, students, uh, wh whoever you are, if you value education as, as inherently valuable for our culture, then you want to take a stand for this. Um, tune in next week to The Soapbox. Uh, Michael Hillard, USM economics professor, will be here. And um, many thanks to Susan Feiner for being here this evening. Thank you, Eric. It's always a pleasure. Bye-bye.